The last few weeks we've been thinking about the church as a witnessing community. And uh, I read this verse last week, and I'm going to read this verse once again. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. As all of you know, this verse is from Matthew chapter 5. And I'm going to turn there to just share something that's where, that really caught my attention while I was lying down to sleep there for yesterday. <laughs> I was lying down and you know, I was working on the message. And uh, when I was lying down to sleep at night, and I uh, not had gone to sleep, I think, but I was just thinking. And then I mean, only this verse I'd read while I was preparing. But while I was in the bed, then the rest of the words came to me, thanks to the fact that I've memorized passages of scripture. So you're the light of the world, verse 14 in Matthew 5. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. I said, that's interesting. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And really hit me that shining as witnesses of God, as those who are set apart for God's glory, is not something we have to strive to do. Because the life of God is already given to those who belong to God. A city set on a hill. Each one of us, we have the life of God in us, and we are like a city set on a hill already. What Jesus is saying is, if you have the life of God in you, you cannot hide it. It cannot be hidden. So it's not like we've got to, in Malala we say, muscle here. we've got to strive, we've got to really, uh, somehow we've got to shine. No, no. Hey, if you have the life of God, what Jesus is saying is, don't hide it. And it says the next phrase, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket. But on the lampstand that it may give light to all in the household. So if you have the light, don't put a basket over your life. <laughs> don't try to hide it. Don't try to escape your divine calling and the commission that you've already been given. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking of today. We're going to be looking at church as a witnessing community. I mentioned in the last two messages that I also was provoked to give this series of messages because the, the theme of the 2024 Lausanne Congress in Seoul was let the church declare and display Christ together. Let the church declare and display Christ together. That's the theme. Any of you who are interested in going into that, you can just hit Lausanne Conference and you have a lot of podcasts, around 20, 25 podcasts, extending into every section of society and every area you may be working in. How do we share the gospel with the rest of the world? Each podcast is more than half an hour, maybe 45 minutes, and many of the plenary sessions will also come very soon. I've been blessed as I've been listening to many of them in the last few weeks. But the world around, those who believe that Jesus is Lord and that he's made a way for the for us to get to the Father. For those who believe that, a group of people who believe that there is good news in Jesus, they are called evangelicals, okay? The word evangelical means you believe there's a gospel. That's basically what it means. So the whole evangelical church, based on any denomination, you know, they all gathered together in Seoul, Luzon, uh, 20 days back. Go, following on from this, so, this is a theme the whole church worldwide is actually looking at. Not just TDF column. <laughs> Let the church declare and display Christ together. So, in looking at this, I said, following on from my meditations at the Men's Breakthrough Weekend that I mentioned there, I first talked about a personal walk with God, and I shared how each one of us got to live a dynamic life, an intimate life with God in such a way that the life of Jesus would ooze out of our lives, would flow out of our lives 
into our families, into other people. And that is what God is looking for primarily, the beginning, for each one of us have an intimate walk with God. And then we looked at and we looked at issues to deal with our heart as to whether we really love the Lord. And I raised a lot of questions. I don't want to repeat that today. And then last week we saw in church as a witnessing community after in personally walking with God, we also got to walk with the Lord in our relationship circles. And that is our immediate family and the church we belong to. It is as we walk as a family, husband, wife, children, husband and wife, or with children and parents, whatever structure of family you are part of right now, as you walk in that family together, because that family is a context in which God builds into us the ability to walk as children of God. That's the first place of learning. And that is why when appointing elders and deacons, it says he must first be able to take care of his own family because if he doesn't take care of his own family, how can he take care of the family of God? So that becomes a first testing ground. So we learn almost everything and family is that place where we learn, where we make our first steps in relating to our parents. I'm talking now to children. You learn how you got to relate to other people. Okay, in relating to your brothers and sisters, you learn how to relate to people outside. And that's where, within the confines of this amazing you know, unit, where you have unconditional love, each one giving each other unconditional love, you learn those steps on how to move on. And so, within the family, there's got to be the right values, the right structures, the right ambitions inculcated and grown. So that as young people move out into the world, they would then be able to capture the plan of God for their lives out in the world. But it's got to be first lived out within the family. And that is why the family becomes the most important unit from which the life of God emanates. And then we said that's not just a family, but it is the relationship within the church, the next group, the next thing. So in, in relationship. So God then teaches us how we need to walk. And so the Bible is full of instructions. I'm not going to back into last week's message, but the Bible is full of instructions on how we need to walk together. So that when the world sees this counterculture group, this group that is contrary to the values and the systems of the world, this group that is turning the world upside down, that's what, that's a phrase from Acts, by the way, if you didn't know that, okay? But it's, I would say it's not we, are not, we don't turn the world upside down, we turn the world right side up. <laughs> Okay, we are upside down now. <laughs> you know, the world is not the way it should be. But with God's help and in view of the scriptures, we are able to point people to the way our lives should be and the way God planned it to be. So we turn the world right side up. And so the church becomes a community of the king. That's a phrase, the title of a book coined by Howard Snyder. As the church becomes a community of the king, we become the standard or the hope the world looks forward to. Something that the world can see. Hey, is it possible to live like this? Yes. That's when the church begins to live as the church should live. when the church begins to function as the church should function. And so we have life groups and other things and various things that we want to inculcate, we, we use to pass on the life of God to people. The structures within the church, every church, may not have, other churches may not have the structures here. 
Other churches may have other structures, but in every particular locality, we struggle, we, we try to cause people to walk in such a way that the life of God is made manifest in the members of the church. Where they are cared for, where they are loved, where there is a community that supports, where we're involved in God's mission together, where we get involved with things around. So church, we first of all learn to walk with members of the church. And as we walk with members of the church, then we begin to walk as God wants us to be witnesses in the community. So we looked at the first personal walk and relationships. And today, we're going to look at the church as a living and dynamic witness to the community at large. First, we walk intimately with God. Secondly, we walk intimately with those around us, family and the church. And then together, we witness about Jesus to the community at large outside. Why? Because Jesus said, other sheep also I have who are not yet in the fold. They need to be brought in. Therefore, go into all the world and preach the gospel, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I am commanded you. Why? Because the day is coming when people from every tongue, tribe, nation are going to be there before the throne of God, worshiping the Lord. And God does not want anyone to perish, but all to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. Therefore, it's incumbent upon us. It is necessity is laid upon us to be involved in the mission of the church. The church is called to both declare and display. So there is both the vocal component where we speak and there's also the dynamic of transformed lives where we live out, display the life of God. I'm going to be looking at quite a few verses today because I want you, each one of us, to get this thought into our mind. And that is, I'm here for a purpose. I'm here not for Jeffy and Deepa's purposes. <laughs> I'm not here for each one of you put your name there. I'm not here for my son and my daughter-in-law and grandson. No. I'm not here for my comfort and my pleasure. No. That's not what it is. We are here for a much greater purpose. I wanted to capture that. And so I'm going to go into passages that explain this. I'm not going very deeply into the practical aspects like I talked last week. I'm going to go more into the plan of God in various verses. So I'm going to start off by reading from Ephesians. And I'm just going to, in every one of these verses I'm going to look at, I'm just going to read that and... Uh, Okay, I don't have it in my notes. As I'm turning my pages, I'm stopping at 1 Corinthians 15. <laughs> Even though it's not in my notes. So in 1 Corinthians 15, in verse, when it's talking about the order of resurrection, there is these verses that come. I'm going to read from verse 24. And then comes the end. When he hands over the kingdom of God and the God... King, when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and all power, he must reign unless he has put all enemies under his feet. This is the age in which we are living. A time is going to come when under the lordship of where Jesus, everything that the Father wanted to do is accomplished. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 and 25. So uh, everything that God wanted to do is accomplished. And after everything that, is, that God has planned for this particular time is accomplished, Jesus is going to hand it over to the Father. Then the next stage starts. So there is this phase of time where the work of Jesus is to bring everything under his authority. Meaning, to bring everything 
to know him and the salvation he has wrought out and to make everyone come under the saving knowledge of Jesus. And, and when the time is come, it doesn't say in the scriptures that everyone will come to know the Lord. It says the scriptures many will reject. But when the time has come, then there's curtains. You don't know when that's going to be. We, you, do not, you and I do not know when we are going to hear the trumpet sound. <laughs> okay? But a time is coming when you and I are going to hear the trumpet sound. And whatever the trumpet sound may mean to different ones of us, this time is going to end, and then the, Jesus is going to hand over a particular time. The second verse I'm going to look at, Ephesians chapter 1. And here it's talking about the plan of God. And I'm just going to read very fast. Verse 9. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention which he purposed in him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of time. So here it says God has made known to us what he's going to do to the end of time. And that is summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven, and things on earth. A time is coming where everything is going to be summed up in Christ. The same thought in another book. In the New Testament. You need to understand this. This is repeated again and again. I'm going to read a few, words, few more verses. Because I want you to understand. That is what God is working towards. That is the history the world is moving towards. The third passage. Is in Philippians chapter 2. And you all know this verse. In Philippians chapter 2. That Jesus, although he exists in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, verse 7, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, but he hum humbled himself by becoming obedient to a point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. Now, it's interesting. One day, every knee will bow. We sing this song. One day, every knee will bow down. Before. One day, every tongue will confess. But the greatest gift for those who gladly choose him now one day, everyone in this world is going to bow their knees. And you and I are called to be witnesses of this truth. If you and I are not faithfully sharing that, a time will come where someone who basically is very close to you will say, why didn't he tell me? And that's what is called, one day, I'll be ashamed of you because you are ashamed of me, Jesus says. So the declaration and the exhortation to witness about Jesus. That we are called to do that. We are called to be witnesses of God. Here it says, everyone's going to bow their knee. Some willingly, some unwillingly. But they have to. <laughs> There's no escape. Everyone is going to bow their knee. This is what the world history is moving towards. I just want to show it to you. I can show many more other verses. But I just chose these few verses so that, and one more verse, okay, next book again, Colossians 1, verse, which I read earlier, 1, verse 18 onwards, I'll read. He's also head of the body, the church, and he's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to a first place in everything. For it is the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, Having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him I say, the things on earth or things in heaven. It's interesting. This is a verse I don't understand at all. The far last part of the verse. Things in heaven and things on earth. What are things in heaven he wants to reconcile to him? <laughs> I don't know. Because all that I know is there are certain things in heaven which will never be reconciled, which is up for judgment. But what are the other things that need to be reconciled to God? I don't know but the word says it. And there's going to be a time of reconciliation. See, can you see the whole, on 2,000 years back on the cross of Calvary, a man died, but that man was not just a man, he was man God. And through that work on the cross, God the Father and the counsel of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit had decided 
that they would reconcile everything back to themselves which had gone away. They would set right everything which was not right. In the meanwhile, those of the descendants of that first man, Adam, the man, <laughs> continue living on earth and we've been fooled into thinking the whole point of our life is our desires and what we want to do. That's not the point of our lives. The point of our life is that we've been created for his glory. We've been created for his will. We've been created to do what he wants us to do. We've been created to walk according to his plan and purposes. And so whatever you plan to do, doesn't matter what job you choose. You, whatever place you are, and that is the emphasis of today's message, you're called to be a witness. You're called to be a witness because God wants witnesses in every station of life, in every situation, in every locality, in every school, in every college, in every industry, in every hospitals, in every offices, in every place. God is looking for his children to bring in his kingdom, to be witnesses to the saving knowledge of Jesus. Melvin Hodges, one of the great church I mean, one who, he's written a lot of books. He said, the church is God's agent in the earth. The medium through which he expresses himself to the world. God has no other redeeming agency on the earth. His body, the church, is the only redeeming agency in the world. Everything else is going to perish. If you put your hope in any other thing and you're living for other things, let me tell you, friends, if you haven't heard it already, all of that's going to be burnt up. A day will come when it's going to be burnt up. But if you are in the habit of making money, praise God. Because God may have given you that gift to make money. <laughs> but that money needs to be used for his purposes, ultimately. If you're in the pros of inventions, praise God. You know, you need to, you know, be a scientist and help other people. That, that's another thing that God told Adam and Eve. Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful in every way. Fill the earth and subdue it. Be co-creators with me. And if you're doing that, praise God if you're doing it for God's purposes. If you're doing it for yourself, sorry, it's going to be burnt up. Could be two people making money. <laughs> One could be burnt up because that was for the wrong purposes. And the others could be, the other one, the other person could be given a crown for what they did because he, he was making money for God's purposes or used as money for God's purposes. Choose which side you want to be on. You gotta make that choice. God gives us this word, which is basically teaching, helping us to understand his will. And then he says, now you determine whether you want to be on my side or you want to be on the side that's going to be destroyed. And that's very important for you to understand the overall plan of God. God calls us to be his community of witnesses. The church is a community of God's people. God's master plan is that God may glorify himself by uniting all things in Christ. Reconciliation. And this happens through reconciliation and restoration of the creation to God's plan. In 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 5, verse 17 to 21, very important verses. We all know this. We particularly know one verse. You know, if anyone is in Christ, it's a new creation. But we don't look at overall thing. Can I just read from there? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he's a new creation. Creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now, all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us a ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespass against them, and he has commit, committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of God, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew, knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The whole, pro, whole work of salvation, the whole work of redemption is all based on the fact that God is calling a group of people who have been set right, who have been cleansed, who have been made anew. And then, they will then declare the manifold wisdom of God 
to principalities and power. And therefore we read in Ephesians 3 verse 10, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Whatever authorities, whatever rulers are there, whatever may be in, you know, having power in the realm we are living in, all of them is to know the wisdom of God and the glory of God through the group of people we call the church. That's God's plan. 9.30. I'm reminding Pastor, we know he's got a train to catch. <laughs> you all need to go. <laughs> okay. So God first brings a reconciliation between Jew and Gentile and every other group of people as God begins to restore us. But here I'm going to tell you something that's very interesting. In the scriptures, there's a word called leaven, polypa. And in the scriptures, Jesus usually talks about leaven as something. God bless you. As you all move on, the church stands with you. Yeah. Not all of them are going. Some are going. Some are needed to take them to a station. <laughs> okay. So, God bless you. So the word leaven is usually used in the scriptures to talk about something that corrupts us. And so Jesus used the word leaven quite a few times in the scriptures. But do you know, so it's usually a word that's negative. Watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees and things like that. But there's one place in Mark 8.15 that this word is used slightly differently. The only time the word is used in a positive way. Uh, sorry, it's not that. In, in Mark 8.15 is an example of it being used in a negative way. And he said, he was giving orders to them saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and leaven of Herod. And basically, Jesus used this word to show that a small corruption can actually corrupt the entire batch. A little bit of yeast that's what leaven is, okay? That's a Hebrew word for, le, you know, yeast. We use it, refer to it as yeast, okay? So a little bit of yeast can ferment the whole whatever is there in the container. But if we take, turn to Mark 33, 13.33, Jesus gives one of the... Wow, I think I've got a... The whole reference wrong. Okay, just a minute, please. Oh, sorry. It's Matthew 13, 33. I've got it right in my notes, but I read it wrongly. Okay, Matthew 13, 33. This is the only place where the word leaven is used positively. Okay? Even Paul talks about the leaven. And it, that's negative also in Paul. But Matthew 13, 33 says, he spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour. It's the, the original word is measures of flour. Until it was all leavened. There's only place where it is used positively. And it's a very direct link to the message we're sharing meditation we are thinking. Now what does it say here? It's the kingdom of heaven, the work of God's kingdom is like a woman taking a bit of leaven and putting in three measures of flour. Now we may think three measures of flour, maybe three cups of flour. Sorry, it's not. I was reading in preparing this message and I found out for the first time, I found out also that three measures of flour is equivalent to making around 40 or 140 loaves of bread. 100 loaves of bread, sorry. So it is some big measure, maybe, maybe a quintal or I don't know what it means, okay? 100 kilos or something. But in three of those measures, the women put a little bit of leaven. And what actually happens? The leaven leavens a whole dough. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is actually, he flips the idea of the leaven making everything corrupt. He changes that whole thing, process, and says, you see, we are so caught up with 
this whole thing of we got to be careful of the world the world will corrupt us and it rightly so because the bible warns us the desires of the flesh the fl- lust of the flesh lust of the eyes both will pride of life the what the world gives us always tempts us and that is true it is there right through the teachings of jesus and through the teachings of apostles but here in this one situation jesus is saying something totally different and what he is saying is this you are that leaven you may think it's insignificant you are just one person in that whole three measures of flour which is a lot that's enough to make 100 bread but a little bit of leaven in that place is going to leaven the whole of that dough what we think is insignificant god can take and use it for his glory what jesus is saying the church the kingdom of god is to affect every area of society that's holy leaven the whole of society is affected by god influenced by the life of god that is in the church in every one of us the people of god changing and being present in a world that needs change will be able to change that world into what god wants it to become the transforming part does not originate in us it's a part of the gospel the part of the word of god and as it transforms us it reach it is supposed to reach beyond us and touch other people very often we tend to think that when i have my quiet time that's because you know i need to spend time with god no your quiet time is not just for you your quiet time is for to touch other people also the reason you are told to read the word is not because you need to stand that's one of the reasons the reason you're told to read the word and spend time in prayer is that because the places you work needs a witness there and you need to be ready to be witnessing there the reason you need to reach out to god and receive from god and hear from god is not just because you want to hear what you need to do regarding this particular problem or regarding your child's education no that's not the only reason the reason you're called to receive from god is because you are a priest you are someone who supposed to hear from god receive from god and give to other people The gospel is not about you and you alone. It is about you. But it's much beyond each one of us. It's supposed to reach out after having changed us. It's supposed to reach out and change the world. When we receive the provisions of God to touch our lives, maybe a financial provision or strength or encouragement or whatever it may be, is not just for jeffy it's not just for me it's for others and that is why when i receive something when i receive any encouragement from the lord as i sit down and pray or when i have my time with the lord my my thought should always be lord for who all have you given me this how many people am i who are the people i've got to share this with lord have you given it to me for to share with deepa to share with nunu today and if you are asking god that question god will tell you if you're not asking god that question you become like the hard seed hard ground where the seed falls and the birds have taken it away it's not that the seed is not being <laughs> planted a thorn but the seed has no effect no use because it's fallen and the birds immediately is gone I'll just ask you a very simple question no one would raise your hands how many of you remember the meditations you had last week how many of you have acted on the meditations you had last week how many of you ask the lord lord make me a blessing i learned this but let me use this to me a blessing now if you are not thinking that type of questions then it's, we become too to inward looking we just become a very selfish disciple meaning i just receive and there's nothing wrong in receiving you should 
you should receive from the lord every day but you but it is incumbent upon you to receive and to be a blessing that's the calling we have on our lives if you're not fulfilling the calling in our lives then what are we doing the things that you get into your lives whatever blessing you know you need to be people we need to be a church that's actually thinking about father help me to reach out we sing that song out in the highways and byways of life many of you are and sad carry the sunshine where darkness is rife making the sorrowing glad make me a blessing make me a blessing out of my life may jesus shine make me a blessing oh savior i pray make me a blessing to someone today but that singing is highly inadequate we need to live it out just singing is doesn't do the work that's just a provocation we should be thinking even while we are singing but we need to be thinking lord what is it now what do you receive from the lord every day you may think is inconsequential maybe something that just encouraged you because you are going through a problem but then if you ask the lord lord what do you want me to do with it you will be amazed at what you, that meditation or the time with god can do to the life of other people because you will always be thinking giving to others helping others calling up others and their fellowship begins to grow within the church and outside the church and when you begin to talk to people like that and when you begin to maybe a non christian in your office in your bank in your school in your wherever you are working in your hospital in your clinic in your office as you begin to receive from the lord and as you begin to say lord who can i share this with and you find a colleague or someone who going through discouragement let me tell you witnessing doesn't mean that you always talk be saved some of us have the wrong impression you know we we want to hit the gospel down everyone's throat you look at jesus how many times he spoke things that were not the gospel encouraging people strengthening people helping people you know healing people just be a blessing just reach out and touch people's lives and as you do that you know like the parable of the leaven says that little thing begins to touch other people and they begin to want to know be close to you they want to know you i heard this this story it's from the luzan podcast of a lady in a particular country i'm not even name the country not india and she wanted to be is a south asian country and she was asked to she was a nurse i think and she asked for to be placed in a, a hospital mental hospital where no one wanted to work in no one would want to work in this hospital but she particularly asked and said i want to go and work there and and her work was so sacrificial that a tv crew hearing about what she was doing came and asked her why she was actually working in that hospital because she was an exceptionally good nurse uh, which other hospitals wanted her and she was not willing to go she said i want to work in this mental hospital okay and then they came and asked her and you know what she said so they asked her why are you working in this hospital and she said she said every member of this inmate in this place is created in the image of god and i want to serve every one of them to know that they are valued didn't share anything about jesus or the gospel or anything it came on a tv you know what happened <laughs> she began she threw this one testimony that's her testimony every person there is created in the image of god and she wants to serve them to know that they are valued and they are important that's all she said she began to have get so many requests from her colleagues will you please tell us how you found this out will you please tell us what moves you what motivates you she was able to witness to hundreds of people she began be invited on the tv shows share about jesus openly because they asked her why do you live like this and she shared a testimony what i'm telling you is god is calling us to witness if only we'll do it wisely 
there will be opportunities to talk further. We are called to witness, to declare, and display the life of Jesus together. We are called to be salt and light in the darkness. For certainly it's the darkness that needs the light. Therefore, a lot of people in the church today actually encourage, there are churches, do you know, that encourage people to not come to church worship on one Sunday of the month. I, I heard about this, I was a bit, you know, I was wondering what is this about. So I began to read a bit more. So they said, I mean, what's the point in, you know, all the firefighters gathering together, you know, for a fellowship when there's fire outside, <laughs> you know. So they basically said, one day of the month, you will actually go and visit people and spend time with them. And share, and if, you, if opportunities come for you to share the gospel, share the gospel with them. There are people trying to see how we can effectively, I'm not saying that's the right thing. I just, I was a bit, uh, you know, puzzled about that. That's why I began to read about this type of churches. There are places where you can't meet for fellowship. But there are people who are coming. Like I told you earlier, there are people coming into even India, but many other countries. People who are qualified as teachers, as office workers, going in as servants. <laughs> because that's the only way they can go to such places to work. Because as a servant, they go out as a missionary. People who have their own homes, people who have their own practices, giving it up because God called them to, to go as a missionaries. And the only way they can go is to go as a servant. So they go out as servants, working as nannies, working as sweepers, working in some other ways because God has called them to be a missionary in a particular country and you cannot go there as a missionary. Some go as teachers, some go as taxi drivers. The gospel of grace that you received is not to be hidden away, but freely we have received and freely we are called to give. Howard Snyder, the author I referred to earlier, says this. Five-fold test of God's plan is given by Howard Snyder. If you're involved in God's plan, whatever you're doing should be springing out of God's love. Whatever you're doing, number two, should be based on the obedience to gospel and stewardship of spiritual gifts. Whatever you're doing should be done in the name of Jesus. Whatever you're doing should work towards reconciliation, healing, and beauty in the world. Reconciliation, healing, and beauty in the world. Education and various other things are involved in this. And in whatever area, whatever you do, should always glorify the Father. This I got from his book, Community of the King. The work of the church is we are genuinely redeemed community. To do the works of God and carry on the works of Jesus. That's what you're called to do. Continue on the work of Jesus. We are to be witnessing to this amazing life that we, we have received. And we are called to share with the world. Both declare and display. And that is why Paul says in Romans 1, 16 and 17, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because the power of God and the salvation to everyone who believes and moves on in verse 17. So in the classrooms or the workplace, wherever we are, we are called to demonstrate the gospel. Live out the gospel practically through not just our words, but through our deeds, our love, and our service. So God is calling us to faithfulness in our workplace. I'll just look at one more verse and then we'll stop. And in this world, we are going through such a terrible time that we think, hey, I mean, it's not so easy. It's not very easy at all. Therefore, I'm going to read a verse of a man we all know. Someone I referred to a couple of messages back. A young man who at this time where I'm reading in chapter 6 of Daniel, he must have been a middle-aged man. May have been an older man, I'm not sure. But he was working in a country. He was maybe the prime minister of three empires. 
but is working there. It's not easy for him. He has put in a lion's den. So you may say, well, if I talk about Jesus, I'll have problems. Yes, you will. <laughs> I'm not saying you won't have problems. You will have problems. Let me encourage you. But God is with you through those problems. Let me encourage you through the life of Daniel that even if you put in the lion's den or the fire, God will be with you. That Daniel was not put in the fire. It was his three friends. But you could put it in the lion's den. God is with you. And so it does not say if you follow me, you're not going to have any difficulties. What it says is I'll, I'll let you overcome because I've overcome the world. But Daniel 6 verse 5, this is for all of us who are working out in the world. Almost all of us are doing that. It says this. I'll start from verse 3 of Daniel chapter 6. Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Then the commissioners and satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs. But they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. This is such an amazing verse. If we as disciples of Jesus say we want to walk like this, I'm telling you, we, don't, we would not need to preach because the life of Jesus will be so much on display. And then they said, then this man said, we will not find any ground of accusation against Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of God. But I want to go back to verse 4. They could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption in as much as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was found in him. God is calling us to display the life of Christ. This is the life of Christ where we depend on God and we really not just say but live out the life where we say it's no longer I that live but Christ that liveth in me. The book of Daniel gives a picture of what the Holy Spirit can enable us to be and what we as a community can be and what we are called to live. A community that points to a God who redeems us and who does in us the impossible, who does through us what we cannot do so that all the glory may go to God because people will clearly see this is not Jeffy. This is not Shanti, this is not Neeti, this has to be their God. This has to be their God. This has to be their God. You see, and that is what God is calling us to. For us to live, to aspire to live such a life that it becomes evident to people that their God is with them. As it talks about Joseph many times. Many times. His God was with them. With him, sorry. Let's pray. God is calling each one of us to be in a place of openness to tell him, Lord, we want to be in this place. Maybe you've never thought much seriously about this. But God this morning is talking to me and to every one of us. I've chosen you with an eternal purpose, with a purpose way beyond yourself. I want to bless you so that you'll be a blessing. I want to help you so that you can be a help. I want to make you a blessing so that you can be a blessing to many others. I've chosen you that you may display the life of my son Jesus. And so each one of us can we de decide and determine in our hearts that we want to be people like that. That as each one of us make that decision, 
the church will become a community like that? Can we determine that as families, we are going to sit down and talk and say, hey, how can we be a greater blessing to others and so display the life of Jesus through us? How can we be a blessing to others who do not know you? Amongst our relatives, amongst other people, how can we be a blessing? Father, this morning we acknowledge that we fall very short. I acknowledge I fall very short of even understanding this great plan and purpose you have for me and for us as a church. And so this morning we want to tell you, Lord, as a family, as a body, Lord, we want to say, Father, will you enable us to understand this more? Help us to understand this great plan, even as Paul prayed for the Ephesians and Colossians, that their eyes may be open to understand this. Oh Lord, open our eyes, open our hearts to understand that, Lord, there is so much more at stake. There's so much involved. You have called us to be witnesses. We are salt and light. And without the light, there's darkness. Without the salt, the, the society would be tasteless. And so, Father, wherever you have placed us, in whatever station of work or study or life you have called us to, whichever family you have placed us in, whichever community we are living in, oh Lord, help us to be more than just people who are called Christians. Help us be people who show the love of Jesus. Help us to reach out. Help us to lay down our lives. Help us to take our time sacrificially, thinking way beyond our own lives. Lord, as a church, help us to be a blessing. There's so much more we need to think and process this for our life together. Will you please help us in the days to come? In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.